Hi. Hi, I'm Norman Connors, and I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So, Norman, um, what year did you get started in jazz? Talk, tell me some of your early influences. Uh, I, st uh, I started in elementary school, I would say maybe four, five years old, six years old, six, seven, around there. And I studied uh, piano and drums and uh, uh, I grew up in the projects, Richard Allen Home Projects in North Philadelphia. And my apartment, my mother's apartment, uh, they used to call it the music room. We always had, we had microphones and piano and drums and, uh, you know, we had instruments. And uh, uh, so I started real young. And my influences back then, Lee Morgan, trumpet player, famous trumpet player, at that time and for a long time, he passed away. He came and played at my elementary school Check, at a concert. Check, one, and two, also two. Uh, Lex Humphreys, who was a drummer with uh, Donald Byrd and Dizzy Gillespie. And uh, Lee Morgan Fountain went with Art Blakey for a while before he went on his own. And uh, a bass player by the name of Spanky DeBress, who went with Art Blakey. And McCoy Tyner, who is still around and still plays great concerts today. When they came to my, my school, and when I seen that, I said, that's it. Philadelphia. Okay. Richie Allen Home Projects. I grew up right down the street, uh, four doors away from Bill Cosby. I was in and out of his house with, playing with his younger brothers. And uh, I used to Herbie Hancock and Ron Carter and some of those. People, I, I didn't get a chance to use Miles at that particular time, he, you know, but I did use Herbie, and Herbie played on my first four records uh, during that time. I was with uh, Buddha Records at the time. Okay. And we just, I was just on the phone talking to a gentleman who was uh, one of the top uh, executives at the time. His name was Alan Lott, and, uh, and uh, he had a secretary. Her name was uh, Sylvia Roan. Sylvia Roan, of course, is like a, she's a big time executive. She ran a couple of labels from Electra to Atlantic, Atlantic and now she's Motown. And, and um, hmm. she was Motown, and now she's, uh, I think she has her own imprint on uh, Sony BMG. On Sony. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. And Alan Lott, he was just, uh, he's a, he was an incredible person. Uh, he, he, he did some of everything. He, I think he worked for Atlantic, and he worked for Buddha. He worked for uh, a couple of other labels that I can't, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Okay. But he worked for a lot of people, and he was a great influence on a lot of a lot of other executives. And he was a great person, and he's still living. Okay. Now, when you look at jazz back during that era we're, 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 we're speaking on, when it seems that jazz now is being, in many ways, less appreciated by African Americans and more supported by um, Europeans. Back then, was it reversed? Did, what was our level of appreciation for jazz? Well, when I was coming up, Art Blakey and people like Art Blakey, Horace Silver, um, uh, Cannibal Adley, uh, I mean, the appreciation was just, I mean, it did, Tremendous. I mean, these guys were like uh, gods, and uh, you know, Ahmed Jamal, Ramsey Lewis. I mean, you know, it was just it was just unbelievable. Duke mm -hmm. Duke. I mean, when I was a, you know, a kid, I used to go watch Duke Ellington's big band and Count Basie's big band, and it was just un, un, incredible. Everybody, uh, Nat King Cole trio. Nat King Cole started singing, became a big star uh, on TV. I mean, one of the greatest singers in the world. I mean, it was just incredible. So you've literally seen, wow, five I've seen generations. It. Yeah, I've seen it. Just I've seen it. I was, I was real young. I started mm -hmm. young. I'm glad I started young. Ron, what year was that about? This is back when I, when I first started? Yes. Uh -huh. this is, I'm, we're going back like in the 50s. Okay. Early 50s. All right. Hmm. Hmm. And when I moved to New York, uh, I played with Farrell in the late 60s. And I started my own recording in the 70s, 1972. As a matter of fact, I'm celebrating 40 years as a recording artist as we speak. 
the seventies. It's really going on forty one years. W what was the climate like in music then? You had a lot of major. Uh, uh, it's like music took a transition from the 60s to the 70s, and yeah, what was well, that climate? The 60s, the 60s were great, R&B, the R&B was great, the R&B groups, you know, Smokey Robinsons and all those kind of people, and the Wilson Pickett's, and it was just, a, 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 the climate was just enormous, and uh, and the jazz was great, Dizzy Gillespie and Miles and, and Charlie Mingus and all that, it, it was just a, a, it was just heavy. And in the 70s, I, I, I came out in the 70s where, uh, you know, it, it became a more smoother, uh, I, my thing was smooth, uh, mixed with sophistication and at the same time mixed with soul, soul and sophistication together, mixed with some R&B and jazz, and I, I came up with a sound, you know, and, uh, and it, it, it was successful. Mm -hmm. And I rode on it, and I'm riding on it now, so it's, it's all good. You got uh, Michael Henderson. Michael Henderson. Michael Henderson was working with Stevie Wonder. He, when I first seen him with Stevie, I thought he was uh, so incredible. And of, and, of course, I thought Stevie Wonder was incredible. And I thought Michael was just as incredible as Stevie Wonder. Michael played bass, and Stevie played pian keyboards and was singing. And Michael Henderson was all of that. And then Miles came in. When Miles seen... Michael Henderson, he took him. He took him from Stevie, and uh, and Michael. I seen Michael develop with Miles, and, and he was just one of the greatest bass players in the world. And I, and I knew I knew all the great bass players, and Michael was one of them. And I, and I I was with Buddha Records, and I did I did about seven records for Buddha, and then I went with Arista. Clive Davis offered me a gigantic deal, and I, I did six guaranteed albums with him. And, uh, and that was a great period for me. And we used to do 80 and 90 and 100 concerts a year. And I had all kind of production deals and uh, producing other people. I must have produced at least 100 people or more. Now, where, back in then, those days, I, I'm assuming, hey, where did you make most of your, your revenue from the, the, the album sales, live concerts? Well, well. In the 70s, I would say, I started in 72, my, I was number one in Japan in 1972, and George Ween took me to uh, Japan, I did 10 concerts. That was a start. And then 73, so I had Didi Bridgewater as a vocalist at the time, and then 1974 I got Gene Conn as a vocalist, in 1974 and 75, and then 1976, I had, uh, uh, 75 I had Gene Conn and Michael Henderson, and then 1976 I had Michael Henderson and Phyllis Hyman. So all the, all during that, those periods, I was selling a lot of records, a lot of records, and uh, to me, it was a lot of records. Now, maybe uh -huh. to the people now, I don't know, but I was selling millions of records. So translating it, what twelve dollars a record back then? Did you get like a royalty on that per? Well, uh, just to sort of reference, you know. Well, when I was on yeah. Buddha Records, I, I didn't make a whole lot of money. I mean, I made a, I made quite a bit of money on the road. Okay. Cause I worked a lot, but but as far as like uh, royalties and things like yeah. that, I, they did. I, they, yeah. they so it was, your, it was your live performances that you really. Yeah, that's where I made That's my how money. you put food on your table. Up to maybe. a point, yeah. then when Clive Davis came and he offered me a million and a half dollars, then that's when. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. That's when I started making money, <laughs> real money. Right. Well, I made some good money at Buddha. Okay. You know, I mean, I mean, I was okay. I mean, it was all right, but they owe me a lot of money. Right. They right. owe me a, over a million dollars. Okay. Right you now. Gonna, are you going to collect? I'm trying to. They don't exist. Are they don't exist? Uh huh. I'm trying to collect. Okay. They owe me though. Okay. They sold all kind of records under the table. And they were selling records everywhere. Uh huh. You know, and I, I never, I, I didn't get, it. I didn't. I didn't get any of it. I mean, I got some of it, and when I went, when I was gold, I was platinum, really, you know. So, all those kind of things. It, it was, it was out there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of records. Who owned the catalog? Huh? Who BMG. BMG. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, BMG. You know, at one time I wanted to buy my catalog, they wouldn't sell it to me. BMG could bought it. So, how, how does that work when you, when you say the catalog? So, the music that you created and produced. Uh, in your contract, is it actually owned by the 
the yeah, label. Yeah, they pay for everything. They pay for, they pay for all the sessions. They pay they pay for everything. So they, they actually own your music. Advances, uh, record sessions. The, they pay for everything. So they own it. Okay. They own it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, after so many years, I think eventually it'll come back to me. Some of it. Okay. But the past three or four, I would say the past uh, seven or eight years, I own I own my own stuff. Okay. I own now. Okay. But I wish I owned that some of that stuff because it was, it was a lot of great music and a lot of hits and and so forth and so on. But from here on out, I own. Okay, that's good. I own my last uh, three albums.